Thank you. So first, I would like to, thanks, uh, to thank the organizer for uh, the school, the conference, and the opportunity to, to talk. So I'm going to uh, present this uh, joint result with uh, Sylvain Crovisier and uh, Omri Sarig. OK, let's uh, start. So, uh, well, first, I'll, uh, for the second time this week, uh, you will have a, a short introduction to entropy. So why should we care? What we do, do we do with it? So it's essentially you, can, you want to count orbits in a certain way. And you can do it for measures. You can do it for, uh, from the point of view of topology. And it, it leads to a lot of uh, interesting, uh, fascinating stuff. You can use it to classify uh, classes of dynamical systems in the probabilistic setting, in the symbolic setting, even for in the smooth setting, we'll see. And uh, as was mentioned uh, in the uh, talk uh, by Keith, uh, well, when you have it's especially interesting when you have systems with, say, some hyperbolicity, which have, because of this, a lot of invariant measure. And then uh, entropy becomes a way of uh, selecting measures, interesting measure. So how do you count? So let me repeat, uh, uh, only for the second time this week, uh, the one way to do it, which is, the let's say, the the Bowen way or the bowen dinaberg way, which is you, you fix yourself a, a, a precision, a scale. This is the epsilon, a small positive number. And then when you uh, consider uh, some time n, then you will say, OK, I will not make any difference between uh, two points whose orbit stay epsilon close within, uh, I mean, during time n. OK, that gives you a, a metric. A, and hence a notion of balls. And once you have these balls, you can define covering numbers for subsets. That's just the minimum number of balls in this sense that you need to, to cover your subset. And uh, you can then extend it to measures as just by saying now you're not interested really in covering a definite given subset, but just anything with a significant measure. And one half was already introduced in the previous lecture. OK, and then once you have this uh, number, then you can say, OK, I'm going to now define, for instance, topological entropy just by saying, OK, I let the scale go to epsilon. For fixed scale, I just compute the exponential growth rate uh, of the covering numbers I mentioned before. OK, and then uh, if you have a nice uh, if you are in a reasonable setting, a nice setting, then you can just say, okay, the topological entropy is just when I want to cover everything. Okay, and for measure, I mean, uh, Catok's formula tells you that at least in the ergodic case, you can essentially do the same. Uh, just this time, instead of covering everything, you just cover a subset of significant measure. Okay, just so feel free to interrupt me, uh, otherwise it's things, so you see them for the second time this day, so. Okay, and then uh, one of the key uh, thing, which is the rational principle, that tells you that actually it is what you see when you're looking at uh, measures is uh, reflects, in some sense, all that can be seen in your system, as soon as you, as you are in this topological uh, compact uh, setting. Okay, and uh, there is a very uh, nice proof by Mishuevich, uh, which is also interesting because the, the way it is, uh, the, the proof goes is to say, okay, if you try to equidistribute point uh, or equidistribute measures, measure uh, on epsilon n uh, separated uh, points, then so you try to build some kind of equidistributed measure when you let n goes to infinity, you will get something which has close to the uh, uh, full entropy. So this is one way to say, OK, this is one more reason to think that uh, 
measures maximizing the entropies are going to be an exciting uh, thing. Okay, anyway, that's something we can decide for ourselves. Now, when do they exist? So, uh, okay, first what I should say is that their existence is, uh, in some sense, much less general than uh, the setting of the rational principle. You need something more than continuity and compactness. One of the things, which was mentioned uh, by Keith, is expansivity. So if no two orbits stay close to each other uh, for all times, at least, uh, in fact, positive and negative, then uh, this will imply that the entropy function over the measure is upper cosmic continuous. So then uh, you achieve your max the supremum is achieved. This means you have a measure of maximal entropy. This same uh, upper semi continuity argument applies, in fact, as soon as you have a C infinity map uh, on a compact manifold. This is uh, due to your new house using uh, Yom Din theory. But uh, interestingly, uh, so not only uh, C0 is not enough, but actually for every finite uh, smoothness, you have counterexample. So the, this was shown by Mizrevich in uh, uh, dimension four or more. And uh, actually, you can build uh, also examples uh, as soon as it, the question makes sense in dimension two. OK, now the subject, so this was for uh, existence, which essentially, uh, well, you have this at least uh, very, uh, this very, well, still general theorem of new house that tells you just C infinity, a person may continuity existence. Even if you don't really know anything about the dynamics, you have this uh, kind of functional analytic uh, reason that gives you measures of maximal entropy. So now the more difficult uh, uh, stuff is, uh, well, what about the number? I mean, as was mentioned, if ever, for instance, you have a system with zero uh, entropy, then all invariant measures are measures of maximal entropy. And this is, well, and actually, uh, this, you can use this to, to, to see something very easy, but still, uh, which you have to keep in mind, which is it's easy to have systems with uncountably many measures maximizing the entropy. So what is the solution to this exercise? You just take your favorite system which has a measure with maximal entropy. So let's say a C infinity map on some compact manifold. And then you take the product with, let's say, the identity on the circle. And uh, while well, using a things about the entropy of product and things like this, you can easily check that, uh, well, now, uh, not on, you have, if you, you, so you had at least one measure of maximal entropy for F because it was C infinity, and now you have uncountably many ergodic measures of maximal entropy. So you have to, to I mean, you need something for this, uh, I mean, to hope that you will have finiteness. So what kind of condition would ensure finiteness? Oh, what type of system? So one of the first type of system for which uh, it was known are subshift of finite type. OK, let me just uh, point out that for existence, we had this expansivity condition. And the expansivity condition is automatically satisfied for any shift on a finite alphabet. And you see here, to get, we have this example of existence. And now among all these shifts, the one for which it is classical, at least, to, uh, uh, that they have uh, finitely many measures of maximal entropy, they have a much more rigid structure. And that's the idea. That usually, when you can prove finiteness, it's because you know a lot of things about your system, about your dynamics. This is the in opposite to, to the question of existence. OK, and then it was shown that this, is, this also holds, in some sense, if you build, uh, if you go classically through a Markov partition, this is a consequence of the, let's say, the Paris result. That is, is also true in the smooth setting for uniformly hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. 
And so, well, hyperbolicity gives you a, a, well, a setting where you can hope to show that uh, so you have finitely many. Uh, so the, for uniformly hyperbolic, this, so this was done in the 70s. So what about non-uniform? Okay, is it true that when you have something which is non-uniformly hyperbolic, let's say all measures are hyperbolic in the, in the Piercing sense, in the sense that they have no zero layer point of exponent, will this, uh, will this give me a uniqueness or finiteness or something like this? Okay, so the, the first type uh, of symbol, in the symbolic category, uh, the answer is somewhat yes. So, well, you have to, to assume something because, well, for subsheet of finite type, you had, uh, by the nature of things, only finitely many pieces. So you would get finiteness of measures of maximal entropy. For the, their generalization to infinite but countable alphabets, you can have, of course, infinite. You can take one system and take uh, countably many copies of it. So you do not, you cannot hope to have finiteness without adding uh, assumption. But for instance, Gurevich showed, uh, I mean, the result that makes sense here, which is that if you assume, if you assume irreducibility, then actually you have at most one measure uh, maximizing the entropy for this type. So in the symbolic setting, you have this. Nice, uh, I mean, the, the result has this natural generalization. And, uh, okay, what about uh, uh, the smooth setting? So actually, uh, it's not enough. So already for uh, smooth but with finite smoothness uh, interval map, so assuming positive entropy, I mean, I've made the, the remark before that otherwise uh, uh, the question is, is, uh, doesn't make sense. Well, uh, you can check. It's not very difficult to build example where you see that in finite smoothness, you can still have infinitely many measures of maximal entropy. Actually, there are countably many. This is, not, this is better than the general situation, but still you can have infinitely many. Uh, the fact that you have here, because of Ruel's inequality, which will appear in a second, uh, you know that when you have positive entropy, measures with entropy close to the maximum will have a uniform lower bound on their exponent. So in some sense, you do not have uniform hyperbolicity, but you have, uh, well, a somewhat strong form of non-uniform, let's say, Piercin hyperbolicity. Still, it is not enough. What do you need more? So for C infinity, it works. I mean, you have, if you take a C infinity interval map, with, uh, with, uh, which is infinity smooth. Not only it has measures of maximal entropy by new house, but actually it has finitely many of them. And what is the, so what is, so that's real inequality that tells you that, uh, so this is in dimension one for maps. I mean, I'm quoting the special case in dimension one for maps or in dimension two for diffeomorphisms of surfaces. So sorry, yeah. uh, you see that if, the, if you have a lower bound on the entropy of the measure, then you have the uh, lower bound on the largest uh, Lyapunov exponent. Okay, so if you want, okay. Uh, so what is the extra thing that you get from you go, when you go from here to here? It's, it's uh, well, it's, well, we'll see. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, this theorem. Now we want to extend it to dimension two. So, dimension, so this was dimension one for maps, and we expect usually that when uh, things are nice with us, then what holds for interval map should hold in a adapted form, maybe, for surface diffeomorphism. So for a long time, there was... Uh, no, uh, well, well, no progress in this with respect to this question. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, Sarik built, uh, so succeeded in building uh, a kind of symbolic dynamics for uh, C1 plus alpha 
surface diffeomorphism with positive topological entropy. And one of the consequences of his construction is that uh, the, as in the, for the interval uh, in slow smoothness, the set of measures of maximal entropy is countable. It cannot be uncountable uh, as in the general case. Okay, but in fact, he's, I mean, he's, and we will build on his result so uh, to, to show the, the finiteness. So this is the, the main theorem. So it's, I uh, repeat, it's a joint work with uh, Silva and Omri. Okay, you take uh, any compact surface, any C infinity diffeomorphism on this surface. The hyperbolicity assumption here is that the topological entropy is positive. Okay, and then you get, uh, I mean, the most important thing is that the, you have only finitely many ergodic measures that maximize the entropy. Okay, and it's uh, even nicer in the sense that if you assume a natural condition for irreducibility uh, of your diffeomorphism, that is topological transitivity, you really get uniqueness. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, our result. It somehow completes my PhD thesis with a little help from my friends. So now I'm going to try to to explain uh, some things uh, that, uh, how you prove this. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, so, once, actually, the, so we will see we prove uh, a little bit more. And uh, this has two, uh, let me quote, two uh, things that we get, let's say, for the price of the previous theorem, two more things. So the first one is uh, you can apply this to equilibrium states and especially uh, holder continuous uh, small potentials. So what does it mean a small potential? It means that they satisfy this condition, which actually uh, somewhat somewhere appeared at some place uh, in the key stock. Uh, the point of this condition uh, usually usually in this business is that you can check that it immediately implies that measures, that equilibrium measures, measures that mu that uh, maximizes the sum of the entropy plus the average of the potential, the integral of the potential, this measure under this condition, uh, they will have positive topological entropy. Uh, they, they will have positive entropy. And actually, the positive is not something abstract. It's the difference between uh, the right-hand side and the left-hand side. So uh, once we have, well, uh, we will see that the same argument that uh, proved the, the theorem about measures of maximal entropy actually applies then to equilibrium states uh, uh, under this condition. Sorry? Uh, yeah, there, so what we will obtain is that the uh, intersection of the support, of the support of two measures like this, uh, will have zero topological entropy. More than that, I don't know. Oops. And the other uh, stuff, which I don't want really to, to read, is that actually uh, we prove a theorem about CR diffeomorphisms. And then uh, everything gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, but uh, so instead of having the condition that the topological entropy is, is uh, uh, non zero, you have to, that it has to be bigger than some threshold where in the numerator you see essentially the Lipschitz constant, and in the denominator you see the smoothness. And this has to do with, well, you have lots of estimates like this, first in a Yumbin theory, or when you try to compute some, uh, or in SAR theorem, and we'll see that that's how it, it comes from. In some sense, the interest of having a CR statement is maybe to understand better 
what's going on in this infinity case, where essentially everything becomes zero. Uh, okay, and then you get the, the same conclusion. Okay, so now, okay, let me. So what is the strategy of the proof? So there are three, uh, let's say three parts. One part is to uh, introduce a, a kind of spectral decomposition, which will be based on the uh, homoclinic relationship, but between measures, not directly between points. Then we prove, uh, so we had this uh, a big theorem of Sarig that I quoted, uh, or at least I quoted some consequence uh, already. Uh, this theorem is very powerful, uh, but it's also very difficult to, to establish. And in particular, you need a construction which is uh, quite abstract. And it's uh, really difficult to understand how uh, what's going on on the manifold is reflected into what's going on on the symbolic dynamics. So uh, here, the point of introducing these, uh, okay, sorry, there is a mistake. It's not hyperbolic measure class, it's homoclinic measure class. That might, I mean, the measures are hyperbolic too, but that uh, the word that should be there is homoclinic measure class. So the point is to have this notion which is uh, clear, uh, let's say canonically defined on the surface and to understand it on the on SARIG uh, symbolic dynamics. And this is where uh, comes the, into play the local version of SARIG theorem. We'll get symbolic, uh, essentially symbolic coding for each of these homoclinic measure class. So then you have this, uh, so, so, and finally, so you have this spectral decomposition into uh, these natural pieces. You know by the local version of Sarik theorem that each piece will have at most one measure of maximal entropy. And now to conclude, you only need to show that uh, only finitely many pieces can have entropy above some threshold. I mean, if you have all this, then you have the, the main theorem. Okay, uh, and, oh, yeah. So what I should say is that uh, we use, uh, I mean, this type of ideas uh, is very close to what uh, Federico, Hanna, uh, Ali Tazibi, and Raoul Ures did uh, for SRB measures on surfaces. Uh, so, some of the problems are different, uh, the results are different too, but uh, the idea that, you, but they, they also had, I mean, they, they introduced this idea that you should look at a version of homoclinic class for invariant measures, and also that you, that in dimension two, you can use, uh, well, planar topology, and that it, it Simple, uh, let's say, simple uh, figures tells you that uh, a lot of stuff uh, uh, that if you... So, I mean, it's, it's different, but uh, uh, it's in the same uh, spirit. Okay, so what are more precisely the ingredients? So, as I said, the basic, uh, I mean, the big thing is the SARIG's uh, coding for surface uh, diffeomorphism. And we uh, use uh, more uh, specifically how, I mean, he shows that uh, in some sense, the size of the alphabet of the symbols that you need to use in his coding is strongly related to uh, how good or how bad is the hyperbolicity on the surface for a given point. I mean, I will give a slightly less mysterious statement when I uh, go into the horrible details later. But that's the... Okay, the second argument is uh, this thing about planar topology. So let me make 
uh, a drawing, which is, well, it looks a little bit stupid, but still uh, uh, one has to, to do it. What is a rectangle for us? So a rectangle is just, you have, so suppose somewhere you have a hyperbolic set with its, oops, So you have this hyperbolic set lambda. Often it will be a horseshoe. So so transit topologically transitive. So locally maximum. Okay, this is the, sorry? Invariant. Yes, invariant. So this is lambda. Well, if you're not too sure about the other words, it's the, the last ones that matter most. So my uh, rectangle is just well, sometimes a rectangle is just a rectangle. So the rectangle here is just the open set. So, but the boundary are pieces of leaves uh, of the dynamical foliations of this uniformly hyperbolic horseshoe. Okay, so this is really, uh, I just, well, and essentially I'm going to, when things intersect in, a, well, their boundary, in a non trivial way, their boundaries have to intersect. And then uh, I know things. That's the second ingredient. Okay, to build these rectangles, to show that you can cover uh, a lot of measure with them, we will use a, a Piesin theory, and uh, especially to build uh, relevant horseshoes linked to, to hyperbolic measure. We will, we will uh, use Catoc horseshoe theorem that tells you that when you have a measure with a hyperbolic measure, so with no zero Lyapunov exponent, you can find a horseshoe which has topological entropy uh, almost equal to that of the measure uh, and which is homoclinically related to the measure uh, and which is close to the measure in, in Lots of different senses. Okay, and uh, sorry, and one, one of the things uh, that we that is known about these uh, horseshoes is that so you have these uh, so the collection of the stable sets gives you a foliation or lamination uh, technically uh, with continuously. Uh, uh, I mean, the leaves are CR and they depend continuously. Uh, on the on the point, so it's not exactly a foliation. It's well, let's call it dynamical lamination or dyna dynamical foliation. And these things are known to have positive uh, transverse Hausdorff dimension. And there is even a, there is a a lower bound uh, for these things, uh, which I mean the lower bound comes into play when you want to do the CR case. For the C infinity case, you just have to know that uh, the transverse dimension is always positive. 
Okay, and so when we do, so we are going to, to do this uh, Jordan theorem thing to show that essentially when, for instance, when, when you have, let's say, two rectangles that intersect uh, in a non-trivial way, the, you see immediately that the boundaries have to, well, that's the definition, let's say, of intersecting. I mean, one meets the other, no, no one covers the other. Then you see that the boundary have to intersect, well, as sets. And then the question you ask immediately yourself is, okay, well, you don't, maybe not immediately, but after the next slide, is whether this intersection between uh, smooth curves are transverse or not. Okay, the topology, of course, doesn't tell you anything about it. But then that's where South theorem, or uh, an adaptation of it in the uh, for dynamical foliation, where you have this kind of partial smoothness, uh, I mean, very classical, uh, comes into play. And here you have the other uh, bound that tells you that for C infinity, uh, in the C infinity setting, if you have uh, a foliation, uh, this type of, of foliation, then, well, the, you can look at the subfoliation defined by, leaf, by leaves which are tangent to some smooth curve, and you will get that the dimension of these bad guys is actually zero. And when you compare with the previous uh, thing, you see that, uh, well, when you have an intersection not between curves, so now what will happen? Well, I will come back to that later. So when you are looking at two given curves, of course these curves could intersect non-transversally, but if you use that these curves actually are accumulated by uh, a whole dynamical foliation like here, then using these two, these two arguments, you can show that, well, maybe not this curve, but another curve, uh, which is just as good as it, as the first one, will have this transverse uh, intersection that you're hoping for. Okay, so essentially, well, we, in, in, at point two, we had topological intersection, and then from three and four, you get nice uh, transverse intersection. And finally, the finiteness, I mean, what is the extra secret ingredient to hyperbolicity? It's uh, Yamdin theory. And more precisely, so what you, Yamdin theory gives you a way to uniformly control the tail entropy, which was introduced by Mizurevich uh, under the name of conditional topological entropy, which I called for some time uh, local entropy, but okay. Uh, which is the, this simple, it's, it's a very simple quantity, in fact. Well, maybe it doesn't look like that, but well. Which is, okay, you, at each scale epsilon, what you do, you, you look at the complexity, that is the topological entropy defined just by asking yourself, how many balls do I need to cover this subset? So here the subset you want to cover is any, let's say, kind of tubular neighborhood of a given orbit. When you are close to a given orbit, close at, at scale epsilon, how many entropy can you, will you, may you see when uh, you keep looking at this epsilon tubular neighborhood, but now you look with a very uh, a much smaller uh, microscope, a much smaller scale. And that's the topological entropy of this set. Okay, this is for one, the neighborhood of one given orbit. Now you can take the supremum of uh, all orbits. Okay, and uh, well here, this is for at scale epsilon. Now, as in the definition of the entropy, you should let epsilon goes to zero. This is the tail entropy of F, okay? And it's also called the tail entropy because one of the key property, which is completely obvious from the definition, is that uh, when you compute, let's say, the entropy of a subset or of a measure, it doesn't matter, okay, you, Will you get immediately from this definition the estimate that if you stop your computation, if you do your computation of entropy 
at a given scale with a given precision, then actually what you can miss out is bounded just by this quantity. So it gives you a uniformity in the, so it gives you a, it, it's a bound, it's a first bound. Now the, I mean, uh, sex entropy theory will give you a much finer bound, but it gives you a uniform bound on uh, the uh, uniformity uh, or non-uniformity of epsilon. And when you are C infinity, the, these things go, goes to zero, this number goes to zero, so you get uniform convergence. Okay, that makes lots of people uh, that I know uh, happy. But here for us, it's even more basic than that. It tells us that essentially, for a given smooth map, there is a scale at which if we compute the entropy, we see almost everything. We don't need to go, uh, to go arbitrarily small scale. Okay, and if it's uh, not C infinity, uh, yeah. No, no, sorry, there is a, no, this is, I forgot to take the limit when epsilon goes to zero. Thank you for, should be clear for, I mean, I, I said it quickly, but yeah, it, it, it's worth repeating. Uh, yeah, of course, the, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's the, that's the list uh, of things you should be ready before you start cooking. So let us start. So the first ingredient is to define this homoclinic measure class. Here I got it uh, correct, it's homoclinic. So uh, this is a very, uh, well, this is a classical ID, let's say, according to the definition of Vivian Baladi, something that was very well known before you started your PhD. So you take, so first you take two points. You say that they are homoclinically related if the following hold, so I, I'm not saying the points are periodic for now, so I have to assume that they have reasonable uh, stable and unstable set, let's say what, what, what is produced by Piesin uh, uh, stable theorem, that is you look at the set of points which converge exponentially in the future or in the past to the orbit of the point you are considering, and I want this to be uh, nice guys. Okay, just so that uh, what I'm really interested in saying will make uh, sense. And now the homoclinic relation, I mean, goes back to maybe smell or uh, is uh, to say, okay, I want the unstable uh, of one to cross the stable of the other in a transverse way. Okay, so the picture is like this. So the, okay, let me keep my colors. Okay, you have, this will be. Okay, let me say this is. A, okay, and this is the stable P, the unstable of P, and then you can imagine the, the rest of the notation. Okay, this is, so you want this. Okay, you, once you have defined this for, sub, for points, you extend it to subset. I mean, there is no, it's completely trivial. I mean, this is just a definition anyway. It just takes care, I mean, this partition just takes care, even in the classical case, of periodic orbits, you need to pay attention uh, about, uh, I mean, the, where you are on the periodic orbit. So that's why you need to have these, uh, these uh, sorry, these uh, partition, and you want that essentially you have a kind of synchronization and the, the matching parts should be homoclinically related. Okay, so this, you can apply this now to horseshoes, which I mentioned before. And now using the lambda lemma, you can check that uh, applied to horseshoes, to, this is really a, well, it's an equivalence relation. And uh, because of, uh, well, everything is uniform and so on, it's enough to find two points which are related 
uh, in each horseshoe to actually establish that uh, they are themselves related in the sense that you have uh, all points for which the periods don't forbid, I mean, the, that are not uh, off. Uh, a module of the periods will be uh, uh, homoclinically related, which is the definition of the subsets being related. Okay, so something that cannot, I haven't yet defined here, so let's just keep that. Okay, and as I said, the classical case, which go back to Newhouse house in the 70s is to apply this to hyperbolic periodic orbits. So, of course, you know, they have stable and unstable manifold. And this is uh, what you call homoconic class. So there are two, two definitions which you can define. The, okay, uh, the, uh, the people I speak with, they, they like the closure. And here we will also like the closure. So if you have a hyperbolic periodic orbit, it's homoclinic class is the closure of the set of hyperbolic periodic orbits, which are homoclinically related in this sense uh, to the first orbit. Okay, and that's, uh, it's well known that, uh, well, for instance, C1 generically, you can define a spectral decomposition using these, uh, well, these things appear in a spectral decomposition. I don't want to, I don't have the time to, well, I, Okay, and now what I'm really interested in is in defining these four measures like in, in a similar way to, to what uh, Federico, Hanna, Raoul, Ali did, slightly different way, but still. So when I have two ergodic uh, hyperbolic measures, well, I say they are related if they are, you have a full uh, measure subset which are related in the previous sense. Okay, and now the homoclinic measure class, well, it's just the, the class for this relation and you can check that uh, it's an equivalence relation on this set of measures. And it generalizes the classical uh, definition in the sense that when you have hyperbolic periodic orbit, they define hyperbolic measures, and the two notions then are the same. Okay, and you can check that actually, at least in the C infinity case, well, don't uh, pay much, too much attention, essentially, uh, with respect to positive entropy measures, ergodic measures, uh, it's essentially the same to speak of hyperbolic measure or to speak of measure carried by these homoclinic classes, which are the closure of homoclinically related periodic points. So it's almost, it's not exactly the same. We don't know exactly what could be, what is the difference. They could be uh, some difference, let's say, at the level of entropy zero, which is why we, we want to, to deal with the measure stuff, not the... Okay. And one of the things we could know, that one of the benefits of uh, going back to this more classical notion where the homoclinic class is a compact invariant set, is that if you have a C infinity map, the entropy function stays stays uh, upper semi-continuous when you restrict to the compact invariant set, and therefore you still have by new house the, exist the local existence of measure, of measure that maximizes locally the entropy. And this is for existence. Okay. Uh, okay, then there is the local uniqueness theorem, which I'm not going to really to speak about since I have no time. Oops. Okay, what is the, okay, this is what I want to, to mention now. It's just the corollary. The corollary tell me, tells me that now I had this uh, global SARIG theorem, but global with a control uh, on hyperbolicity and, uh, well, linking the hyperbolicity for the map to uh, how uh, small sim the symbols I must use. I don't, can't not really explain more in the few minutes that remain. And, uh, but here, the, the, what we have obtained is this. Now you can focus on a homoclinic measure class, and they, are all leave, they can all be lifted somehow to a single piece of the symbolic dynamics. And the consequence of this is that each piece will have at most one measure of maximal entropy. 
I mean, you will actually have one measure that maxim exactly one measure that maximizes the entropy among the class, and this measure either it is of uh, entropy, which is the topological entropy of the map, or it's something lower, and then it doesn't count as a measure of maximal entropy for the whole thing. But essentially, you have here you have the local uh, uniqueness. Okay. And now the well, in uh, zero seconds, the finite uh, multiplicity uh, that we want to prove now can be formulated as this: If you take any positive uh, number, then the uh, you can look at the homoclinic measure class which have entropy in the sense that they carry measure with entropy bigger than this uh, positive number. And this is a finite subset. And this, when you combine this with the previous uh, uh, uniqueness theorem, you get uh, the main theorem. How much time do I have? It's over. OK, so let, so that's the proof. <laughs> well, you know all my secrets now. OK, let me just uh, conclude very quickly. So I would like to say that, uh, well, it is, so in some sense, it completes my 20 years old PhD. Uh, now it leaves still uh, some problem, especially, so now we prove uniqueness. For finite uh, smoothness, actually, we don't yet have, uh, we think we can have, but it's uh, not uh, uh, really a counterexample that would extend uh, to really show that C infinity is necessary. OK, I don't want to, no, no, no time to mention two and three. And then, of course, uh, so a further question, which is much less, uh, uh, well, which is really uh, open. We don't really know to how to, to deal with it uh, now, is you have the spectral decomposition. Can you get more information? Especially uh, in this spectral decomposition appears entropies and periods of the various species. What can you say about that? And then this would give us a classification of surface uh, diffeomorphisms. Uh, OK, and then, uh, well, what about higher dimension? So maybe uh, Yuri Lima can tells, tell us something about the case of three dimensional flows which should be, well, interval maps should be like diffeomorphism of surfaces, which should be like uh, flows in three dimensions. Well, maybe we don't have to wait 20 years for that. And now the well, bigger question is, what happens for diffeomorphism in higher dimension? So we know that some extra assumption is needed. It's not clear why. Uh, it's not clear which one uh, well, we do the job, uh, are really necessary, or whatever. Anyway, so we're already three minutes over time, so thank you.